Hi, this is Ashish Shankar, Head Investments at Motilal Oswal Wealth Management. Uh, welcome to this new edition of uh, Know Your 4C Manager. We've covered quite a few fund managers uh, through this uh, series. Uh, today I have one of the youngest managers that we work with, uh, Amit Ganatra. He spent close to 15 years in the equity markets. He's a chartered accountant, uh, CFA and uh, don't go by his age, he's racked up a stellar track record through his Invesco Contra Fund. He's done close to 17.6% compounded over the last 10 years. I know that he has a clear philosophy of managing money and he's here today to share some of his insights with us. Uh, Amit, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks Ashish. Right. Uh, first out, you know, uh, we are in a very interesting phase. We are in the midst of the earnings season. Uh, we have an impending national election happening sometime next year. Uh, the economy is uh, hopefully getting back on the growth track. Uh, how do you read this entire situation and how do you think things will evolve over the next uh, year or two? So, uh, see, in last uh, uh, one year, see, it, I mean, in last three years, actually, you know, India's uh, narrative has changed quite meaningfully. So. You know, one year ago, India's macros used to be very strong and everybody was very gung-ho about India's macros. Uh, but everybody was waiting for, you know, earnings recovery. So one year ago, if you would have discussed, we were all saying that, okay, India's earnings recovery is very, very crucial. Uh, suddenly, in last six months, uh, you know, there are concerns about India's macro. But at the same point of time, it seems that th there is, you know, disbelief about the entire earnings recovery. Because, you know, some of, uh, some of the changes which have happened, which have led to this deterioration of macro, exactly happen to be the reasons why, you know, the cyclical recovery of earning has strengthened. And the simplest example that I can give you is, you know, people are completely worried about high oil prices, right? So, I mean, oil at $80 basically means that, you know, it's a big concern for India. You know, I would be very worried about oil at 80 if our inflation used to be at 8.9. Then, then, you know, then oil at 80 is a concern. But if, if most of the commodity prices along with oil are almost at their, you know, all-time highs, and if we are at 5% inflation, and if our 10-year bond yield is already at 8, then actually it's not, you know, a much worry on the macro. At the same time, you know, there is a huge worry that these high oil prices will have an impact on our fisc. Now, there also, if you look at the math, uh, you know, state governments, they actually benefit on account of high oil prices because their taxes are all ad valorem. In fact, they have suffered this uh, over last two years because of low, uh, you know, real estate prices because of which stamp duty collections have got impacted for them. Uh, but that has been made up, one, partly because, you know, GST has been underwritten to them to some extent and secondly, high oil prices have helped them. So that actually high oil prices are, you know, positive for states. And as far as central government is concerned, they have anyways, you know, so they were subsidizing, you know, oil in the past. So at that point of time, it was negative for center. Now, apart from, you know, kerosene subsidy to some extent, there is no other major subsidy that they, the cost that they bear. So to that extent, it's a, it's a event which is neutral for center and it's positive for state. So something that is positive for state and neutral for center actually cannot be negative for FISC. The only area where we struggle is the current account. And there also, you know, uh, your currency was overvalued last year. So if you look at most of the RBI documents, you know, from a real effective exchange rate perspective, we were overvalued. And now, you know, we more or less we are reaching our fair value. So, so and there, once again, there also, see, one, one has become 1.85. So I recollect, you know, when I was an analyst 2002 to 2007, entire period we used to run 3, 3.5% 3 current account deficit and it was regarded as a very comfortable current account deficit to have. In 2013-14, at one quarter, I think we touched five or in fact, we touched even six and I think that was the time when India was actually vulnerable. Right. One becoming 1.85 does not make us vulnerable. It's obviously incrementally negative, but it's like, you know, from a macro perspective, India was like among top five, now it has become top quartile. So you think the macros are deteriorating at the margin, but they're still comfortable? Yeah, and, and the same, same reasons which are resulting into, you know, deterioration of macro also happened to be reasons because of which micro is also, you know, started to showing, it has started showing some signs of improvement. Uh, you, you talk to, you know, any entrepreneur, uh, you ask him that what is good for him, a deflation or an inflation. He will say 5 to 6 percent inflation is very, very important for him because that is something that gives him pricing power. Right. See, we, we talk about, you know, earnings growth, but for earnings growth, you first need top line growth, right? And top line is not only volume, it is value. 
So if you don't have pricing power, then actually you cannot have top line growth. And if you don't have top line growth, then you don't have a chance for earnings recovery. The, uh, the other is that we internally we have done this analysis. We have done this analysis from 2003 onwards. And since 2003, uh, we have just taken LME metal index, so which includes oil as well. So there is this LME metal index. And we have seen that what is the direction of that index and how does our nifty EPS fare on a one year lag. And actually we have observed almost 70% correlation. So since 2003, you know, never have we seen Nifty EPS doing well when the index was down. And never we have seen basically, you know, Nifty index doing poorly when the index was up. And in fact, the latest evidence was available in 2013-14. See, this period was regarded as good for India. Right. Right. The People were positive. But you look at the earnings. Earnings cycle actually never recovered. In fact, extra 6% NPA got added to banking system. And now in this environment, when commodity prices are hurting us from a macro perspective, your banks are actually getting away with only 40-50% kind of air cut on their steel assets. Right? Who would have bought these kind of steel assets if you know commodity prices would have been where they were two years ago? So, actually this environment, you know, uh, uh, there is a very large population in India which is uh, SME, uh, SME plus, so these SMEs are you know linked to most of the large industries, right? The top five industrialists in India, you name them, and then there is one common business which all of them share, which is commodity business. Take Ambani's, Birla's, Tata's, Jindal's. There's one common business which is commodity business. Now we want them to do capex, so we want you know private sector capex to revive. Now when will they do capex? Only when commodity prices are where they are, right? So I think this environment that is getting built up actually is a very, very perfect environment for the cyclical recovery of earnings which we all were waiting for. For that to take shape, these are the building blocks. So given this macro backdrop, uh, are there any themes or sectors that you find interesting at the moment and you know how, how do you go about positioning your portfolio? So I think uh, uh, in next two to three years, we are very confident of a cyclical recovery of earnings. It will largely uh, happen through sectors which are cyclical in nature. So in India, we have three domestic cyclical sectors. One is financials. Banks in India have been, you know, uh, dealing with the NPA challenges now for almost last 10 years. We are almost at the fag end of the recognition cycle. Uh, once that entire recognition phase is complete, then most of the banks will have a very clean balance sheet. So you will have a very strong, you know, earnings stagger coming from that sector. You're particularly referring to corporate banks. Largely corporate so banks, yeah, banks, yeah, which is where the challenge lies, yeah. So that would, so some of the PSUs also will benefit on account of that, right? Secondly, uh, industrials as a sector can also do well. Uh, there, the only challenge is that uh, uh, that sector is like you know a second level, second order beneficiary. So first, the, you know, uh, balance sheets have to deliverage, which is happening. So on one hand, if banks are basically you know becoming cleaner, you also have to assume that corporates' balance sheets are also basically becoming stronger or cleaner. Once that you know cycle gets complete. And if commodity prices remain where they are, then you might start seeing, you know, a lot of, you know, private sector capex also happening. That is still some time away, but I would say that that's, that's also there. Uh, the third is uh, the entire consumption. So, see, consumption on one hand has been holding, you know, India's uh, earnings uh, growth for some time now. Uh, but the rural consumption is some, you know, one theme that we have been bullish now for last one year. And I think that that theme, in fact, last one year was the first evidence that, you know, there are some signs of improvement as far as rural India is concerned. It is still not a, you know, completely well-established uh, story. So it's still, uh, uh, we are basically in that wait and watch mode. But I think this one is interesting area where, where basically, you know, a lot of turnaround can happen. A lot of companies which are exposed to rural India can actually do very well uh, over next uh, three to five years. Uh, and I think these three trends, basically, these three sectors will, will drive the cyclical recovery of earnings. So, Amit, that brings me to my next question. What is your investment philosophy or process uh, to go about building a portfolio? So, uh, my investment philosophy in that sense is very simple. It's very, uh, you know, similar to uh, what we have uh, at Invesco India AMC. Uh, see, for us, we, we strongly believe that equity markets are inefficient. And if you have a very strong research platform to back you, uh, then you can take advantage of those inefficiencies and, and create value. Uh, see, for me, every company has one, an earning cycle and other, a, a, a valuation cycle. Now, sometimes, you know, companies generate earnings which are basically year, whereas their potential long-term earnings are year. So, you basically try and take advantage of, of those mispriced, mispriced earnings. earnings. Right. Uh, at the same point of time, sometimes, you know, company from a valuation perspective is trading year, whereas either his long-term average is this or basically, you know, uh, 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 his potential valuation should be this, then once again, there is an opportunity out there. So, so we where can, you uh, 
wait for reversion to the mean, mean reversion mean exactly reversion. so right. that basically the, so mispriced valuations or something like that so so you try to basically you know take advantage of these two efficiencies so that is one way to basically create value for us the other way to create value is that uh, time arbitrage so i think one of the biggest arbitrage still that is left in the market is uh, you know your ability to take long term view so generally you know there is lot of focus on next quarter earnings and you know next year earnings uh, but if you are willing to basically take a 3 year view then i think sometimes you do get even you know good growth companies at very very attractive valuations so that's the other arbitrage that we try and exploit uh, in terms of style uh, you know while i do manage uh, uh, growth oriented opportunities also uh, so i do manage growth oriented strategies at invesco uh, but by heart you know i am i am a value investor so right now uh, when it comes to value investing sometimes we often uh, see that you know your hypothesis may not uh, turn out to be the way you wanted it to be in the near term right and that can cause uh, price damage uh, how do you ensure you stay through the cycle i mean what is the mental makeup that a value investor needs to have so first is obviously patience lots and lots of patience the other important thing is see from our perspective while you know we we go for value uh, but one thing that we always you know uh, so here also you know you need certain level of discipline and that discipline necessarily comes from the fact that uh, while you would want to you know buy something that is cheap and it's always good to buy cheap but for the sake of cheapness you should never compromise on quality now how do we ensure that we do not compromise on quality so there are three guiding principles for us one is that uh, see at invesco we have this uh, you know internal stock categorization process now that process itself is very strict why because we track 300 companies out of that 140 companies are categorized so we reject more than what we accept so any company which has a poor business uh, uh, you know franchise or or has a corporate governance track record which is poor or has any balance sheet related challenges then that that gets filtered out right at this stage so i i will not invest in any uncategorized non categorized company so to that extent that is first you know guiding principle for us uh, the second guiding principle for us is that uh, uh, you know we we many times end up taking you know pnl risks uh, but we generally you know don't take balance sheet risks right could so, you elaborate a little bit on this yeah so i'll give you an example so see now in 2012 13 or you know that entire period of 2012 to 2014 uh, you know there were three sets of uh, you know companies which were very very cheap in the market so one was this you know set of industrial companies uh, but here you would you know uh, 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 companies which are you know like net cash companies so companies like uh, bharat forge companies like thermax Uh, companies like voltas these were all basically you know part of our industrials exposures uh, industrial sector but the thing was that their pnls were very weak but the, the balance, balance sheets were very very strong right, right. Uh, then, then there was this so another set no of survival risk for yeah exactly so then there was this uh, you know another set of uh, uh, industrial companies but these or infrastructure related companies uh, but they all had huge balance sheet risks so there was you know there were lancos and gvks and gmrs and jayprakash of the world so they all had huge balance sheet risk and third is the public sector banks were also very cheap now uh, in contra fund when we wanted to basically benefit from that cheapness we only chose the first set of companies now at that point of time we did not have any clarity in terms of you know in 2014 narendra modi will win the election because he had not even filed his candidature so there was no uh, you know visibility in terms of improvement either in terms of perception or in terms of earnings for any of these companies at that point of time but the most important thing was that we knew that till the time the cycle does not you know revive these companies can easily survive so that basically then you know so it it's one thing to talk about being patient but there is something which needs to give you that ability to remain patient and i think that balance sheet strength actually gives us lot of ability to remain patient and that's what we generally tend to do we we might take lot of pnl risks uh, but we generally you know don't take balance sheet risk and the third thing that we uh, uh, generally tend to do is that see we do not always go for absolute cheapness so there are times when you know uh, uh, market does provide you absolute cheapness we 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 actually love that those times but then there are times when you know absolute cheapness is not available so then you go for relative cheapness so an example of that would be you know december this december Uh, you know there was hardly any mid cap and small cap opportunity which was available in the market so what we did in contra fund was we basically then started uh, you know buying large caps now large caps were not cheap on an absolute basis but they were cheap on a relative basis so just for the sake of cheapness you know you do not necessarily then go down the quality curve so once you follow these three guiding principles then what we have noticed is that then it it holds you through through times when you know things are not in your favor so that brings me to my next question how do you avoid value traps 
because often you know you can uh, buy a company which is very cheap but uh, we've seen that uh, some of these companies uh, uh, do not necessarily play out the way you want them to so how do you how do you uh, you know detect value traps so the the second guiding principle actually helps us a lot uh, see value traps basically can largely happen because of two reasons so one is that uh, uh, you know you you think that the problem is cyclical but what if the problem is structural then obviously it's a value trap because you you are buying it at a time when the uh, life cycle from a life cycle perspective is earnings is actually weak so you expect some sort of a mean reversion from a long term perspective but the problem is structural now honestly there is no remedy for that there all you have to do is you have to use your experience you have to basically you know use your knowledge and uh, there is lot of subjectivity so for example last year you know it for me was value but for many other you know people uh, it, it seemed that it's a structural challenge and now as it seems that it was more of a cyclical challenge and it was not a structural okay. challenge so it's important so, to determine whether the problem is structural or is it yeah, temporary yeah exactly so that is one so the, and the other is that uh, you should always avoid taking balance sheet risks because see before your call goes right the company can actually become insolvent and uh, so in that sense what we tend to do is since we don't take balance sheet risk it then gives us that ability to you know wait till the time our call goes right and internally we generally you know give 3 years for companies to you know do the way we expect them to do uh, sometimes you know companies end up doing well in the next year itself sometimes it takes them 2 to 3 years but then we give them basically 3 years if after 3 years also suppose if a company is not doing well or the outcomes are not in line with our expectations then we admit our mistake and then we move more more along there is another concept which i have heard you talking quite often about which is operating leverage and uh, i know that this is a framework that you used to ident- identify companies could you talk us uh, a li- uh, through this uh, framework yeah so see uh, in india what we noticed uh, was that uh, so one of the reasons why you know indian companies were struggling in terms of their earnings was not only the weak top line so top line obviously has been a challenge which is now in fact you know going to improve uh, but uh, we also saw that lot of companies basically had created capacities in the last cycle and lot of these capacities were underutilized and the good thing was that these underutilized capacities you know were existing across sectors now as a result of that uh, you know while the top line was in fact not doing so badly but the ebitda basically was very very weak in the past cycle and and in financial terms you know we call this the problem of you know uh, operating leverage so operating leverage can work both ways so one is that if if you are if if you are actually in a process of creating capacities or if you have just created capacities then it first brings you fixed costs so that way basically you know it hurts your eventual earnings uh, the other thing that you know capacities do is that once they come generally they are funded by debt so initially you know your interest and depreciation is also high so as a result you suffer not only at ebitda level you also suffer at pbt level so in our, our term we call it you know financial leverage so from from that perspective you know some good companies which are in a capex mode actually you know end up struggling at a time when we have just finished their capex but from your perspective if you are basically able to identify at that stage then then you know there is a very strong you know two or three year cycle that you that you benefit from uh, purely because you know first the rocs will go up uh, so from a life cycle perspective it's an enhancing roc period which is a what markets basically generally tend to like so as utilization levels go up is the proportionate on the bottom line as well as ebitda uh, linear or no 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 it's, so that is one so one is the roc aspect the other is on a pnl perspective also you know it's a fantastic outcome because uh, you end up uh, you know getting a uh, 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 ebitda cagr which is very very high as compared to you know what the top line is so in fact you know in our own uh, uh, you know entire uh, investment universe so we just tried and you know did this analysis in terms of uh, the companies which have this operating and financial leverage uh, what kind of outcomes you know they have delivered so for example in last one year in fio 18 on a 12% top line CAG, uh, top line growth uh, we got a pat uh, growth of almost 55 kind of percent so that's the kind of you know uh, disproportionate outcome which is potentially possible for companies which have yeah, this operating and financial leverage yeah in fact uh, a lot of our clients have benefited we did a similar strategy with your pms team uh, with the rice strategy which was based on the operating leverage and financial leverage and it's done extremely well over the last 2 years yeah so see this 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 is a uh, this is a very focused kind of a strategy because that's you're only focusing on these two levers uh, but the thing is that if you get it right because see, these kind of companies they need some top line traction so you unless and until you don't get top line traction it is possi- it is difficult because it so, will work so you this. think this framework still has legs to go in the current cycle i mean do you do you find many opportunities which are 
uh, which fit into this framework even today so when we first you know started uh, thinking about this framework we were actually not honestly we were not very clear in terms of you know how long can this uh, uh, you know continue to basically you know be an attractive opportunity uh, however what we have noticed is that see on one hand india's capacity utilization has marginally improved from where we started so it is there is still you know significant room from you know overall if i take from a top down perspective but even on a bottom up perspective what we are finding is that within sector so for example you know pharma is not known to have operating and financial leverage but there also you know we have identified one or two names whereby companies have incurred large capex companies have incurred uh, you know significant they have made investments in r&d they have made significant investment in us markets and now they are basically you know prepared to or they are positioned to do well over next 2 to 3 years uh, so the good thing is that uh, in in sectors where which are not known to have you know operating leverage also or where whereby capacity utilization is not a challenge today or capacities are not underutilized we are able to identify you know one or two companies which have you know under utilized capacities or have, have basically operating in financial leverage so i think this makes sense uh, 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 even from a long term perspective it's just that ideation uh, using only these two levers is slightly more challenging as compared to uh, you know some of the other levers that you look so if you are only focusing on top line so along with you know operating in financial leverage if you focus on top line if you focus on you know uh, gross profit then you are adding more levers so which means ideation is basically more broader your ideation is basically you know uh, is not as as strong as what otherwise it is there but if you are able to ideate well then the then the outcomes are quite disproportionate so amit uh, you know we keep getting asked uh, questions about the market and you know timing uh, you know investments into the equity markets uh, i mean lo- we spend a lot of time answering these questions for our clients and investors Uh, what is your view on timing markets should should one really time markets or is there a better way of looking at things see my thought process on this is very clear that you know this is one of the two mistakes that investors generally tend to do so one is they try to time the market uh, the other mistake that they tend to also do is that uh, you know they try and go direct i think both are you know big mistakes uh, uh, that generally investors tend to do and which ensures that you know ultimately the kind of numbers that we see in markets see even sensex since 1980 the kind of numbers that we see it's actually staggering i mean the returns <laughs> is just non believable i mean some of the long term now some of the mutual funds are now completed almost 20 years track record our own mutual funds have completed 10 years track record and the outcomes basically have been fantastic uh, but you know unfortunately investors have not uh, you know somehow benefited uh, why because you know uh, so uh, you know the simple reason why uh, Uh, you know you many times need a financial advisor is to be able to uh, you know help you in managing your greed and fear and which is what you know on a direct basis you are not always able to do and that's why you many times you know need that financial advisors help in terms of I guiding you through flows are very strong when markets are going up and and, and that's yeah, the other way around right so so my sense is that uh, uh, see if you have a very very large uh, you know one time lump sum investment to make then if you are trying to value the market and if you are also trying to basically you know evaluate various options available to you then i would say that that's a fair thing to do uh, and within that you know you can always say that okay you know i have uh, i have a very large ticket size uh, uh, investments to make and and large caps are very expensive and that's why i'm investing in mid caps and that's a that's a fair thing to do why because you are trying to value the market uh, but you know uh, for otherwise the best way to you know value creation in market is to you know participate on a regular basis and do it with the help of a financial advisor or you know any other uh, investment expert don't basically you know try otherwise other, otherwise very difficult to then create value in the long term right uh, when we were doing a little bit of research at our end uh, we figured that it's simple match that you know from 2018 to 2025 if i take a broader uh, time frame uh, even at a nominal gdp growth of let's say 11 12% india can easily double its gdp from let's say 2 and 1/2 trillion dollars to 5 trillion dollars uh now obviously that is going to take up per capita consumption for the country as a whole as well uh what is your uh, broader vision where do you think we will be in another 6 7 years let's say india at 5 trillion dollars in 2025 how do you see the economy and you know uh, what are the broader opportunities that you think exist see honestly we you know we try and look at it the other way around so for us uh, see, if you look at you know some of the data points for india in most of the sectors the kind of under penetration that we have or the kind of under representation that we have today it's so acute that you know then the opportunities are actually there across sectors 
सो वेदर यू लुक एट फाइनेंशियल वेदर यू लुक एट ऑटो वेदर यू लुक एट इवन टी इवन टू व्हीलर्स फॉर एग्जाम्पल यू नो सो फॉर अ लॉन्ग पीरियड ऑफ टाइम नो वी वी यूज टू थिंक दैट टू व्हीलर्स इज अ कम्प्लीटली सैचुरेटेड मार्केट बट नाउ वी हैव रीच अ स्टेट दैट यू नो हाउस होल्ड आर नाउ वॉन्टिंग टू ओन द सेकंड टू व्हीलर सो इट्स एक्चुअली अ न्यू सेट ऑफ डिमांड विच इज गेटिंग यू नो कम्प्लीटली क्रिएटेड फॉर अ लॉन्गेस्ट पीरियड ऑफ टाइम वी यूज टू थिंक दैट यू नो टेलीकॉम सब्सक्राइबर्स इन इंडिया इज डन बट नाउ लुक एट वॉट जियो इज रिपोर्टिंग सो बाय बिकॉज पीपल आर नाउ बाइंग सेकेंड सिम्स so to that extent you know even in the most saturated categories you know we are seeing growth even at this stage so if you think from a next 7 years perspective the numbers can actually be you know very be very large and the opportunities will actually present themselves across sectors so we are very confident about that uh, i think the only uh, the only you know challenge to this entire opportunity is that simultaneously we will also see lot of disruption and this disruption will basically you know happen across sectors like financials it will happen in consumption space with auto media and entertainment Uh, it will happen even in you know old economy uh, spaces like energy in utilities uh, so i think uh, from our perspective what what we are trying to do is we are trying to also you know try and understand that how some of these you know leaders in each of these you know sectors how are they preparing themselves for this eventual disruption and and the other thing that we are also trying to do is that do our dcfs do they factor in you know such kind of disruption risk or not so i think these are the two areas that we are trying to work on because i think opportunity wise uh, you know uh, i think there is tremendous space for you know mo- most of the sectors to do very well and that, that is so so india has this twin benefit one is the penetration of you know products the second is the growth itself so even if you take you know a simple uh, thing like credit growth for last so many years why do we think that you know banking overall except for this npa challenge overall you know banking in india has done very well why because you had this wonderful opportunity of penetration which means credit to gdp going up and gdp was also growing so then you get once this twin engines fire then top line to some extent you know is underwritten then all you have to do is you have to identify the right platforms or the right vehicles through which you you know you enjoy basically this outcome and for that i think this disruption is one you know challenge which one has to deal with when one is you know trying to uh, analyze these opportunities right right uh, during your early years were there any uh, mentors that you looked up to or investment gurus that you had followed uh, uh, and you know are there any any are there any people who influenced your investment style or uh, you know the pro- process in fact uh, most of the skill sets that i have today uh, most of them have been acquired acquired uh, uh through people with whom i had the opportunity to work with uh so i started uh, you know so dbs chola uh, I, i used to work under pradeep pathak he was the cio uh, he was the guy who actually taught me how to you know look at banking sector so banking sector actually is a very different sector as compared to a normal manufacturing sector and he was the first guy to basically you know um, uh, make me understand in terms of how to actually look at banks and i think that actually ended up making me one of the you know better banking analysts in the industry on the buy side uh, uh, at 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 uh, at religair uh, and uh, you know simultaneously invesco i had uh, you know this privilege to work under vetri uh, who was my ex cio there uh, so he uh, he uh, not only you know helped me become a very good analyst uh, he also gave me an opportunity into fund management and he actually actually taught me you know how fund what fund management is and you know how to manage uh, manage funds along with that uh, he had a huge uh, role in uh, you know uh, uh, he is like my role model in that sense because he he, he is a demonstration of a fact that how 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 to be a good human being and a, a, and a good leader so you know it's not only about being a fund manager but along with being a fund manager or along with you know be- becoming a cio how simultaneously to be a good human being and how to be a good leader so uh, he has had a huge influence he also basically you know uh, uh, made me uh, realize the power of reading that you know uh, it just amazes us that how much basically you know knowledge that he can share with us so the, the, he has had a great influence uh, then my ex colleague vinay paharia uh, he 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 was the mid cap fund manager uh, at invesco uh, see uh, most of the people when they look at mid caps they only think uh, of mid cap from an alpha creation perspective he was the only guy who basically you know used to look at mid caps along with the risk that they presented so for him he used to always tell that you know in mid caps alpha automatically gets created because you know these companies are so young that eventually they can become you know very large uh, but uh, what you have to basically protect is the downside because once you do that if you try and if you manage avoid if you manage to avoid accidents then you can automatically basically create lot of value so he was the guy who actually taught me you know how to look at mid caps 
my current uh, CIO Tahir. Uh, so I, do, I have not basically you know worked with him for a long time, but in whatever little time that we have worked, I think he is the guy who made me realize the importance of you know focus. So sometimes you know as fund managers you know you keep on adding companies, and before you realize your portfolios are like you know 80 stocks and 90 stocks, and then post that actually you know they they lose that ability to create alpha. So once you know he joined, he was very particular about you know backing your conviction, you know creating basically uh, a focused you know uh, uh, portfolio. So I think that that has also basically played a played a role in terms of you know uh, uh, making me realize that that is also important as far as fund management is concerned. Uh, apart from that, uh, uh, you know uh, from uh, uh, from people whom I have never uh, with whom I have not worked but are you know uh, so Howard Marks is one such person who has had a great influence. I think uh, he basically has made me realize the power of consistency and importance of margin of safety. So if you read Oak him tree. basically, you know, uh, uh, or, or if you listen to what he says, typically he lays a lot of emphasis on how consistency and compounding actually creates a, you know, it's a more powerful tool than, you know, short term one or two years of outperform or strong outperformance. So he has had a very huge role uh, in my thought process. Uh, the other one is Michael, uh, Michael J. Mabusan. Uh, he basically uh, made me realize that you know uh, in fund management uh, uh, luck is equally important as much as skill so you know if you are doing very well then it helps you to be humble and be grounded because uh, it makes you realize that you know lot of it would would be luck and uh, it's the same other way around so you know sometimes you might be able to identify best of companies and everything goes right but ultimately you still don't create value for your investor so many times you know you're not lucky so so luck the importance of luck is what you know he made me realize in, in this entire fund management. Uh, at Motilal Oswal, we have this philosophy of knowledge first. So, are there any two or three uh, top reads uh, that you would recommend uh, for us or for our investors to become better at what they do? So, I generally, you know, uh, I go more, I listen more to podcasts. So, uh, you know, there is this uh, Masters of Finance. Barry Retorals. Yeah. So, I think that is one uh, that I generally like and, you know, in fact, uh, this Howard Marks and others, I mean, that is where I first started, you know, listening to them and then I got uh, influenced. Uh, in terms of books, uh, you know, I, I generally try to keep it simple. So, all those, you know, uh, one up on the Wall Street or… <laughs> So those kind of simple books is what basically you know I have read. So I generally see uh, my style is more to learn from people around me rather than you know trying to uh, uh, you know perfect theories because there it's all theories. But here uh, the good thing is that I, ha I had this opportunity to work with uh, you know investment ma masters themselves. So right. then I got to learn a lot from them. Right, right. Great, uh, Amit. Uh, it's been a very enjoyable conversation, and I think we've got much better insights into your investment philosophy process and the framework. Uh, so all the best, and uh, keep uh, creating wealth for our clients and investors. Thank, thank you. Thank you Thanks, very much. Ashish. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for listening in to this series of Noya 4C Manager. Uh, I hope you got a reasonable insight into the investment process at Invesco as well as uh, Amit's approach into building a portfolio. Uh, if you'd like to give us feedback, you can write in to us on email, follow us on Twitter or watch our videos on YouTube. Thank you very much.